Can I remind members of the COVID-related measures that are in place and that face coverings should be worn when moving around the chamber and across the Holyrood campus? The next item of debate is a debate on motion 3081 in the name of Kate Forbes on Budget Scotland Bill. And as members will be aware, at this point in the proceedings, I am required under standing orders to decide whether or not, in my view, any provision of the Bill relates to a protected subject matter, that is, whether it modifies the electoral system and franchise for Scottish parliamentary elections. In the case of this Bill, in my view, no provision of Budget Scotland Bill relates to a protected subject matter. Therefore, the Bill does not require a supermajority to be passed at Stage 3. And I call on Kate Forbes to speak to and move the motion. Up to 12 minutes, Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Throughout this budget process, I have been open and transparent about the challenges that we face. And as we approach the end of this financial year, we are still awaiting the finalised position from the UK Government in terms of this year's budget. Prior to Christmas, we were told we might have to pay back consequentials. In mid-January, the message changed positively. The £440 million was confirmed and there would be further consequential funding. And so, in recognition of my commitment to Parliament to provide as much transparency as possible, the fast approaching deadline of year end and the requirement to finalise our budget position to give certainty, particularly to the health service and local government, I announced a further £120 million for local government and we published the spring budget revision just last week with the latest figures. Presiding officer, last week's an announcement of funding for the cost of living crisis has changed the position again, not by increasing the expected consequentials, but by decreasing the funding and it means that the spring budget revision will need to be updated at the first available opportunity. Frustratingly, as I stand here at stage three of the budget, with about six weeks to go until the end of the financial year, the position is yet to be formally and finally confirmed. Absolutely. Presiding officer, why does it matter? Well, it matters because Parliament often presses me for greater transparency, which is what I'm giving in this statement. It matters because this is real money. It affects all of our lives. And ultimately, it matters because it demonstrates the extreme constraints of the devolution settlement within which we operate. Due to the arbitrary and strict limits on carry forward, i.e. being able to use funding on either side of the 31st of March cutoff, if consequentials are to be used meaningfully this year, then I need to give certainty now, today. The changes to date in a very short space of time are significant. They will impact our assumptions on next year's Scottish budget, and I will update Parliament once we receive the final position at the UK supplementary estimate outcome later this month. Presiding officer, despite all of this, I want to move on to the most important issue affecting households across Scotland right now, the rapidly increasing cost of living. Large rises in energy bills, increased costs on everyday essentials, rising interest rates and the UK government's new national insurance hike are causing huge concern and worry and people are struggling. Those additional costs will hit the most vulnerable in our society. The additional energy costs alone will place significant burdens on many. Estimates suggest that this could move a further 211,000 households into fuel poverty and around 235,000 households who were already fuel poor into extreme fuel poverty. This would result in a total of 874,000 fuel poor households, an increase of 43% on most recent 2019 published statistics and 593,000 households in extreme fuel poverty. So the extent and the depth of the need is stark. And that, presiding officer, is why we will honour our commitment, whatever other budget challenges that we face, to pass on the full £290 million to help families now. This, this addition... This additional support will be the latest in our efforts to target funding to help those most in need. We are already using the powers available to us to support hard-pressed households, including targeted assistance for those on lowest incomes, delivering the unique Scottish Child Payment, awarding £76.7 million this year and last to low-income families through the bridging payments, paying 530,000 low-income pandemic payments last year, funding discretionary housing payments, an additional carers allowance supplement in 2020 and again in 2021, delivering the winter support fund to help people heat their homes and meet rising food costs, and the continued £41 million investment 
in the Scottish Welfare Fund. I will. Pam Duncan Glancy. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for, for taking this intervention. Do you accept that measures in this budget will not meet the child poverty targets? Cabinet Secretary. What I am coming on to say is that in terms of the challenges that we face right now, I think the measures that we have outlined will only go so far. And I'll outline what I think the next steps are in terms of providing as much support as possible. Because with this £290 million, we can go further. But I want to be clear at the outset that we've explored a range of options and routes, and I've heard calls from Age Scotland, the Poverty and Inequality Commission, and the Joseph Rowntree Foundation to ensure that it is targeted. And it's frustrating that we do not have all the levers I'd wish to have, such as a full social security system or tax system, to be able to best target and deliver that support. And so I am therefore today, if I could make some progress just on the substance, if that's okay, I'm therefore today announcing that there will be three elements to the package of support today. Firstly, we'll provide £150 to every household in receipt of council tax reduction in all council tax bans. The council tax reduction scheme already identifies households in greatest need and will allow us to target this intervention. Secondly, I'll provide local authorities with funding to pass on £150 to other occupied households in bans A to D in Scotland. In total, combining these elements, 1.85 million people, or 73% of all households, will receive £150 of support. I've discussed this matter directly with COSLA as recently as last night, indicating my preference for this to be distributed as a payment rather than as a council tax credit. However, due to the urgency of mobilising this funding quickly, councils will have a choice. They can either deliver a direct payment or a credit to council tax accounts, as long as it can be done in April. This is clearly an imperfect scheme. It will reach some households who may not need it, but it's the only route we have to make sure that we reach those for whom it will make a difference quickly and simply. I know that the cost of living crisis is affecting households who are not in receipt of benefits as well, who are not claiming a council tax reduction, and they are facing hardship too. We need to do what we can to prevent those households and families on the edge of the poverty line from falling over it. And so the third element of the package is that I'm also announcing £10 million to continue our fuel insecurity fund to help households at risk of self-disconnection or self-rationing their energy use due to unaffordable fuel costs. The package today is in addition to the further £120 million I announced previously for local government next year to ease their pressures and help prevent inflation-busting council tax rises. We will go further in ensuring that councils have as much discretion to tailor their response quickly. Andrew Johnson. I am very grateful to the Cabinet Secretary for giving me just as two points of clarification. So, Can I clarify that these measures will be taking place in the coming budgetary year rather than the current one? And secondly, in terms of how this is going to be paid for, I'm assuming this will be paid from, from the 284 uh, 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 reserve that was contained within the spring budget revision, or, or is it coming from other sources? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, yes, this will kick in from um, the beginning of April, so uh, next financial year. And secondly, in terms of affecting this, it's too late for a stage three amendment um, in terms of when we receive the detail. So I'll be in touch with the Finance Committee, but it's to confirm that to affect this change, it, we will need um, to take it through the autumn budget revision. So that I will clarify that to the Finance Committee. Um, in terms of going further to help uh, councils have as much discretion, I am also announcing today that I will allow any existing underspent discretionary housing payment funding to be redistributed between councils and carried forward next year to allow them to provide targeted discretionary support. I will also allow any existing underspend of the Scottish Welfare Fund to be carried over by local authorities for the same purpose. But finally, I want to say honestly and openly that this is not enough. Households across Scotland, across the UK, are struggling with the wide range of rising costs, and many of the macro levers, for example, around energy regulation, reside with the UK government. And so in that spirit, I'll be writing to the Chief Secretary, to the Treasury, again highlighting that we do need to work together urgently to use our joint powers to do more to tackle the cost of living. And I hope that this chamber can unite in that bid. Presiding officer, there is one further update I wish to share with the Parliament, because one of our key objectives in the budget was economic recovery. And if 
households are struggling, then uh, businesses are identifying um, some of the challenges that they face as well. As the Chamber will be aware, the Government committed to maximising our COVID recovery support for businesses. And as part of this, I previously announced the allocation of £276 million of Omicron business support funding for the current financial year. Following consultation with business who asked for support to now focus on economic recovery, I'm pleased to announce today the allocation of further funding to support business sector recovery, including some of the sectors that have been hardest hit, like the event sector and the travel sector, as well as city and town centres. So this includes an additional £16 million for culture and major events that have faced cancellations. For tourism, there's additional funding to support inbound tour operators of £7.5 million. We know that international tourists spend more when they visit. So supporting this sector helps drive recovery in retail and tourism right across Scotland. Um, yeah, briefly, Marjorie Fraser. Secretary, for giving way, you might know there's a there specific issue with nightclubs not able to access money from the nightclub support fund because they are classed as hybrid because they operate a bar alongside nightclub premises. I understand the Nighttime Industry Association are meeting the Scottish Government on Monday to discuss this. Will she look at how that fund might be uh, readjusted to be able to support those in that category? Cabinet Secretary. I'm keen that that money gets out the door to support businesses that need it. And as he has just referenced, we have met a number of times with the uh, nightclub industry. We'll continue to do so. Happy to look at the criteria, but we did obviously set out funding that was as targeted as possible, knowing that we can't reach all businesses. But I will certainly um, keep his comments in mind. Um, I've got one more minute and I've got two pages left. So if you don't mind, I'm going to persevere. Um, we'll also provide £3.5 million for outbound travel agents that have been impacted by near continuous restrictions on international travel throughout the pandemic. And coming on to the important issue that's been raised a number of times about supporting city centres to recover, we will make an additional £3 million specifically available for city centre recovery to improve footfall and help those businesses that have been affected by, for example, office closures. Presiding officer, we will also be providing additional support for the childcare sector because a fully functioning childcare sector is a pivotal part of our national economic infrastructure and we're providing £6.5 million for that sector. And then last but not least, we understand that many SMEs have already adapted, but more are keen to invest in digital uh, adaptations. And so we're providing additional funding of £3 million to help SMEs continue their digital journey. And so, presiding officer, as I close, all of these grants will provide a bridge from resilience to recovery. And as I move to the, the, the motion today, and as we open stage three today, I think we can all agree that we are still in unprecedented times. It requires a quick and a flexible response from government, which we have demonstrated today, but it also requires unity across parliament. And I hope that members can vote to support the budget at stage three tonight. And I move the motion. Thank you. Thank you. Um, members may wish to be aware that we have time in hand this afternoon for intervention, so there may be opportunities um, there as, as the afternoon proceeds. Can I just invite members who wish to speak in the debate to press their request to speak buttons now? And can I call on Liz Smith? Up to eight minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And can I begin by uh, congratulating warmly the Cabinet Secretary on her exciting news that she uh, announced earlier in the week? And we. We, we wish you well in the months ahead. And uh, can I also uh, start on a note of considerable agreement because um, the Cabinet Secretary cited the fact that the budget process uh, is not satisfactory in terms of uh, exactly what the Finance Committee uh, said in its report, that there are real concerns over the timing of budgets. There are real concern about the definitions of old money and new money. And there's also a lot of uh, concern about the challenges of working to estimates. And this is not just an issue between uh, Westminster and Holyrood. This is an, an issue between uh, Holyrood and local government who've been saying exactly the same thing. So I think, you know, uh, at base level when it comes to budgets, I think there, just as the Finance Committee suggested, there is a need to try to ensure that we have better planning uh, process for, for the budget. 
No, I think uh, it, it is very appropriate, actually, to um, think again about the context, the economic context uh, in which uh, we find ourselves. Because while the main economic forecast on whom the Scottish Government obviously uh, relies, both for the formal interrogation of the budget statistics and for Scottish uh, Government policy making, uh, they ha have indicated some short term relief in uh, recent terms and GDP growth has been better. But the longer term predictions for the Scottish economy still remain exceptionally gloomy. So the main trends show that Scotland is behind the rest of the UK, but they also point to serious structural problems within the Scottish economy, including imbalances in labour markets, and we've uh, debated this uh, several times already. But the fact remains, and it is a fact, that income tax revenues are showing a £119 million shortfall for 2022-23. And this means that the revenue uh, from Scottish income tax is growing more slowly than the block grant adjustment. In other words, despite having more taxpayers devolved to Holyrood, we are facing a growing shortfall in income tax revenue, possibly rising to £417 million in four years' time. And of course, since the budget statement was delivered on the 9th of December, we know exactly what the reaction of local government has been, and we know what the reaction of business has been, and the Cabinet Secretary, quite rightly, has... Uh, made uh, reference to the significant increase in the cost of living. Now, the Cabinet Secretary has uh, admitted uh, to the Finance Committee that there are serious issues in relation to this, but she still fails to accept that the UK Government provided the Scottish Government with record funding for this year's core block grant, not counting the funds from the UK COVID spend, and a record funding settlement for the next three years. And she reiterated uh, this afternoon that, and she said this at stage two, that she does not expect to be required to pay back the 440 million COVID funding, as was previously thought. And whilst I fully appreciate that there are severe issues uh, with regarding to the um, planning ahead of budgets and the fact that these estimates um, have turned out not to be wholly accurate, not just uh, in the UK, but in Scotland too, we know exactly what local government has felt about the uncertainty and the difficulties that they face because, and I know my, some of my colleagues will refer to this uh, later, but at stage one there remained a real terms cut of 251 million, what well, was 80 million short of what COSLA believed is necessary. And I'll leave my colleagues to pick up some of that. For business, what, uh, yes I will Mr Rennie. Willie Rennie. Um, Liz Smith will have seen that the HMRC um, have issued a winding up order against the division of Liberty Steel, which could have implications for the workers at Clyde Bridge and also at DL. Does she think the Finance Secretary should perhaps address this in our closing remarks, including giving clarity as to what the disputed guarantee for the potential clean up of the site? Does she think the Finance Secretary should provide that? Listen, Leave it up to the Cabinet Secretary as to whether she picks up that offer, Mr. Rennie. When it comes to businesses, whilst acknowledging uh, the helpful support in the form of small business bonus, there has undoubtedly been very strong criticism of the SNP uh, that they have ignored requests to extend the duration and the level of relief. Mark Crowthall of the Scottish Tourism Alliance said that support was not nearly enough to avoid the impending cliff edge facing many businesses in June. Liz Cameron of the Ch Scottish Chamber of Commerce said that the Scottish Government should have gone further in supporting business. David Lonsdale of the Scottish Retail Consortium said that the SNP support for business was a pale imitation of UK Government support, and it goes on. Secondly, I, I won't if you don't mind. Secondly, the SNP should remember that budgets are about spending money wisely. How much, how much, better, would it have, how much better would it have been if the SNP hadn't been so profligate with taxpayers' money. Because here, here's a reminder of what we're talking about. 47.4 million on Ferguson Marine in the last financial year when the original estimate was, was 28 million. 4.5 million of the 45 million of loans of, to BIFAD, which had to be written off. 98 million on the ferries overspend. 40 million on the malicious prosecution of Rangers administrators and Audit Scotland confirming that the 43.4 million of loans to Presswick Airport had to be reduced 
to 11.6 million to reflect all the losses. Presiding officer, the list goes on. And then bizarrely, we have the money being publicly committed to the plans for a second independence referendum, no doubt being expanded every minute as the SNP tries to in vain to write or perhaps rewrite a coherent strategy for paying our pensions, saying what currency we, we would use, or explaining how the huge black hole in Scotland's public finances could ever be met. But as well as this, as, no, I won't. As well as this, we have very serious concerns about the SNP's desire to spend millions of pounds on a national care service, which, if we listen to local government and many stakeholders in the care sector, is by no means what Ms. they feel Ms. Smith, is... Ms Smith, could you just give me a moment, please? Um, can I ask for respect and courtesy while Ms Smith is speaking? Thank you. Ms Smith. I, 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 thank, I thank you for that, for presiding officer, because... What I'm uh, citing here is not what I'm thinking, it's what local government and some stakeholders in the care sector are saying. Well, the, pe the people are the very ones who are represented by local government and by the care sector. And what they're saying is that it is by no means the right way to tackle... I won't, Mr Swinney, if you don't mind, because I'm just about to finish, I think. I think I'm about to finish. Councillors from the SNP... Labour, Conservatives, they've said that the upheaval that is required to restructure the social care system into a national care service could be, and I quote, hugely well, damaging. Councils like Falkirk, East Lothian, Fife, Highlands, Argyll and Butte are clearly very worried about the proposed Ms. changes Smith is not and how they would way. affect local accountability. Do I have time? You do have time, Ms Smith. Mr Stewart, Kevin Stewart. Um, uh, thank you, President Officer, and I thank Ms Smith for giving way. Uh, does Smith, Ms Smith recognise that in the consultation, the publication, the analysis of the publication which has just taken place, 70-odd percent of people want to see a national care service? This is about delivery for people, ending the postcode lottery and doing what's right for them. Does she not agree that that's the right thing to do? Ms Smith. Mr. Mr Stewart, I am listening to the people who would have to deliver the services, local government and social care, and they are desperately unhappy, including many in Mr Stewart's party. Presiding officer, because of the arithmetic in this parliament and the unholy alliance between the SNP and the Greens, this, this, this budget has been a fait accompli from day one with very little engagement with the other political parties. Do I have time again? Briefly, a brief intervention. I'm, I'm, I'm very grateful to Liz Smith for giving way. I wonder if she would enlighten Parliament of what changes she would make to the budget bill the Finance Secretary has put to Parliament that would support her additional resources to local government. Where would the money come from and how much would it be? Liz Smith. I, I'm, I'm not sure Mr Swinney has been listening to what I've just been saying. I cited all the waste. but I, And I've also... I, I, I've, I've... Members, members, I cannot hear Ms Smith's contribution and I would be grateful if we could make sure that that, that is the case and we and can Mr. indeed Swinney, hear. I have also just cited the fact that when it comes to the National Care Service on which millions of pounds are proposed by the SNP, we have grave reservations about whether that money is worth spent. Well, Smith, I, I won't this time. Ms. Smith, officer, in conclusion. Because of the arithmetic in this Parliament, I go back to this again, and the unholy alliance between the SNP and the Greens, this budget has been a fait accompli from day one, with very little engagement, I may say, with the other political parties. It's a budget that has failed to put economic recovery first, and it's failed to put forward the delivery of local services. The SNP, in my opinion, has failed to listen to business, it's failed to listen to local government, and it's failed to understand where the public priorities lie. As such, we cannot support it. Thank you. I now call on Paul Sweedy. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'd also like to add my congratulations uh, to the Cabinet Secretary on our delightful news, and I wish her and her family all the best for the coming months. I'm sure it'll be a even more frightening experience than the budget, <laughs> uh, but I'm sure it'll go well. <laughs> I'm sure it'll go very well. Um, but I might as well also be unequivocal. Sorry if it's not so much of a, a baby shower or a gift, um, but Labour won't be supporting the, the budget today. <laughs> um, I'm afraid as a budget, we think it's timid, regressive uh, and uh, ambitious. 
uh, and does not do nearly enough to alleviate the cost of living crisis, which is no longer looming in the distance, but as the Cabinet Secretary herself said, is staring us directly in the face. So we all have to have a duty to do everything we possibly can to address the hardship faced by families. I am afraid that is why we do not think it does enough to address the real substantive concerns being articulated by Scotland's under-resourced and under-appreciated local authorities. And it does nothing to reboot our economy after the pandemic. Presiding officer, the government could have used this year's budget to invest in upskilling in the future of education and upgrading Scotland's antiquated public transport infrastructure. We could have been standing here today welcoming radical, transformative domestic policies that would have lifted people out of poverty rather than compounding the hardship they are already facing. We could have been leading the way on a post-COVID recovery plan that would have seriously addressed our economy's lagging productivity, stagnant wage growth and substantial labour shortages. What did we get instead? A budget that will force councillors of all parties across Scotland to cut £250 million from crucial local services, despite the inadequate sticking plaster announced by the Cabinet Secretary. A budget that delivers a paltry 48 pence pay rise for care workers. And a budget that settles for a rise of almost 4% on rail fares and a further increase of over 4% on water bills. With inflation projected to hit 7% this year, interest rates are also likely to rise. So families are being hammered with an increase in food, fuel and energy prices too. Presiding officer, we know that today is essentially a foregone conclusion. Members from the SNP and the Greens will rise to their feet, proclaiming how excellent and transformative this budget will be. But the fact of the matter is people will be worse off. The very people we are sent here to represent will see their incomes hammered, their bills increase, and for those fortunate enough to have them in the first place, their savings diminish. It is really that straightforward. Well, the Happy to take an intervention. Kenneth Gibson. I'm hearing a lot of criticism of the Scottish Government, but I don't seem to hear anything of the Westminster Government where a lot of these responsibilities actually lie. Yeah. Paul Sweeney. Well, I'm more than happy to uh, adumbrate on that particular issue because I'm no uh, friend of the Conservative Government, that much is for sure. And I think we have to hold both governments to account. And they say politics is about choices, choices that both governments are failing to, to actually capitalise and make the most of. Every member on this, this government's benches has a choice. Do they toe the line and make their constituents poorer? Or do they stand up and say enough is enough, whether at Westminster or in this chamber? Experience tells me that I would be foolish to hold my breath waiting for the latter. Presiding officer, I just want to return to what I think is the most pressing issue we face, the cost of living crisis. The Joseph Rowntree Foundation said just last week that those in low-income households will now pay 16% of their costs after housing on energy bills. Yet for middle-income households in Scotland, that figure is just 5%. The pain is not being felt equally. Citizens Advice Scotland recently released analysis showing that over a third of all Scots now find their energy bills unaffordable. And just yesterday, Advice Direct Scotland revealed research which concluded that over 70%, more than two in every three Scots, are now worried about not being able to pay their gas and electricity bills this year. Have to give way. John Sweeney. I am grateful to Mr Sweeney for giving way. Does, having just listened to points which I think are absolutely valid, does he not accept the absurdity of the position of the Labour Party, who are going to vote against a budget tonight that includes the doubling of the child payment, which puts resources directly into the hands of some of the poorest families in our country, and the Labour Party of Scotland is going to turn their back on those self-same families this afternoon? Paul Sweeney. I am afraid, afraid the Deputy First Minister offers a false choice here. What I say is what measures have been brought forward we welcome, what measures have been brought forward are welcome, but they are not enough to nearly address the scale of the hardship being faced. I am pushing the Government further. I am pushing the Government further on this issue because at the same time, whilst we announced all of these issues going on, but Shell and BP are recording combined profits of over £22 billion, and that is why Labour has called for that windfall tax on oil and gas companies, a proposal that his party's own members of parliament didn't even turn up to vote for in the House of Commons last week. That itself 
would have saved every household in Scotland over £200. And the lowest income households would have been £600 better off. Why on earth didn't they turn up? Again, they say politics is about choices. It is about priorities, presiding officer. That is why Labour has called for a £400 Scottish fuel payment targeted at Scotland's hardest hit families for a top-up to the Scottish Welfare Fund to ensure local authorities have the power and capacity to help those in need, and for the cancellation of increases in water and rail prices. In fact, each and every one of those proposals are within the gift of this government and within the available £238 million spending envelope that is additional. This budget does not go far enough to, capa uh, to capitalise on that opportunity. As just announced, the Cabinet Secretary is offering a basic £150 credit or payment through the council tax system, a system that is already regressive and was supposed to be abolished over a decade ago. It is a system that does not work to target that support. They have been slow to get out the traps on delivering for people, and they are now only allocating half of the unallocated sum of £238 million. They could have done something more constructive, more creative, such as using the carers allowance supplement to target that support more readily, or the child winter heating allowance to do it as Labour has proposed. There are still 60 to 70 million pounds still to be allocated. Why aren't we pushing the throttles to the absolute maximum to get that money into the pockets of the neediest families? The 10 million pounds announced for full security, that works out at just 16 pounds for every person on universal credit or pension credit. I'm afraid it simply isn't enough to nearly address the harm being faced when bills are skyrocketing by £700. Presenting officer, yes, the Scottish Government holds, uh, the Conservative Government in Westminster holds some of the answers, but we can not simply pretend that the Scottish Government is doing everything it possibly can to help people. If that were the case, they wouldn't be ripping £250 million from Scotland's councils next year, and Scotland's care workers would be receiving a more substantial pay rise and a 40, uh, 48 pence paltry amount that will barely even dent the scale of the cost increases they are facing. That is a tacit acceptance of Tory economic doctrine that has led to the difficulties facing Scotland's economy today. More of the same won't fix it, and I think deep down the Cabinet Secretary knows that to be the case. So my plea to each and every member here today is simple. Stand up and be counted, because the facts are clear. Scotland's poorest will struggle to survive this year and this budget does not do nearly enough to alleviate that hardship. Thank you. I now call on Alex Cole Hamilton. Thank you very much indeed, Presiding Officer. And can I start by offering my heartfelt good wishes to Kate Forbes on the news that she can become an impending member of the greatest club in the world. You have all our good wishes. Um, Presiding Officer, I'm sorry I'm joining you remotely today, having tested positive for COVID-19 this morning. It isn't how I would have wanted to contribute the budget process this afternoon, but is a reflection of our times. Because the shadow of COVID is cast long over this budget. The job of uh, recovery is only just beginning. In our hospitals, where hundreds of thousands of operations have been lost, in our schools, where children have missed out on so much, and across our economy, where footfall remains down and the company accounts make for difficult reading. The last thing, the last thing businesses, public services and households needed on top of this was a cost of living crisis. The doubling of the child payment in this budget, which we all support, was supposed to drive down poverty, but I fear for what impact it will actually have, while household incomes fail to compete with 7% inflation, while food prices rise, while Scotland's rail and water prices rise, and of course, the national insurance goes up. The critical child poverty targets set by this parliament were already at risk, even before COVID or these dire economic circumstances. It is why both of Scotland's governments must go further. Scottish Liberal Democrats want to see a cross-government combined cost of living rescue package to help thousands on the brink. That means the reversal of SNP and green rail price hikes, the scrapping of the Conservatives' national insurance hike, unprecedented investment in retrofitting homes to insulate ho households against soaring energy prices, a doubling and expanding of the warm homes discount, boosting disability benefits because the Scottish Government can do better than copy a UK government policy that leaves them three or even four percent below inflation, new broadband social tariffs to vulnerable customers, extra financial support for this government's new smoke alarm requirements because many just can't afford the hundreds of pounds it will cost them right now, and a windfall tax where oil and gas companies have made record profits on the back of the energy crisis. Households are worried about hikes in council tax too. 
And the Finance Secretary has set the same elephant trap as her predecessors. Year after year, the SNP laid down a punishing cut to councils, only then at the last hour to offer a little extra cash. This time, the £120 million was described and, as, and I quote, a funding boost. It was labelled by the Finance Secretary as additional funding. Make no mis mistake, let's be clear, when you delete £370 million from a budget only to restore £120 million of that, that still makes for a £250 million cut. There are no heroes today on the government benches. What I do not understand is why, year after year, the Green Party goes along with this charade. The SNP have always been centralising, believing that ministers know best. They don't hide it. Just look at the police or what's now planned for social care. But it is a depressing reality that this Green Party has become ingrained in this pattern of council cuts and central government ring fencing. Only last May, they were promising a new era for Scottish local government. Well, presiding officer, the new era looks very much like the old era. Brutal council cuts and no prospect of local tax reform in this parliament. The same old tricks, the same old sleight of hand. Broadly speaking, if you can boil it down, education is well, half of what our councillors do, of what we ask them to do. So the impact of these cuts will be felt in Scotland's classrooms almost most of all. Despite all the disruption, despite all the promises of extra resources, teachers and parents are still struggling to see any difference in what's on offer in our schools. It's no wonder then that the poverty related attainment gap is wider now than it has ever been. And the government is still to take air quality in our schools seriously. And today's cuts to councils just won't help that. And we have seen the SNP Green government visibly embarrassed by their now notorious recommendation to chop the bottom off our school doors. But presiding officer, the bigger embarrassment is this. The height of this government's ambition is to fund changes in just 2,000 of Scotland's 50,000 classrooms. That is all that £5 million will get you. It needs proper investment to clean the air. That means a HEPA filter in each and every one of Scotland's classrooms. And the Finance Secretary is always keen to impress on opposition members the need to account for extra spending. So here's an idea. Take the £17 million that this SNP Green government is about to spend on putting children as young as four or five through senseless national testing and instead invest it in keeping them safe in our schools. Investing in infection control will do more for attainment than national tests ever will. Presiding officer, the reality is that this SNP Green government has a central mission, but it isn't the climate emergency, and it's not education, and it's not health. You would struggle to point to the Greens moving the dial on any of these topics, in fact. Instead, their votes are there principally for independence. The energies of this government are shifting towards it now. We've seen it through the last week on pensions, where, by the way, the claim that taxpayers in the rest of the UK will pay for Scottish pensions post-independence holds about as much water as Donald Trump expecting Mexico to pay for his border wall. Regrettably, it consumes political oxygen, the attention of ministers and the attentions of this parliament. I, and I think most of the people of Scotland too, would far rather we instead in this place, in this chamber, devoted our time on things like the existential threat to humanity that there is in the climate emergency, on helping children recover from two years of disruption to their education, on driving down the painful waiting lists that now exists in every corner of the NHS, on overhauling Scotland's meagre response to long COVID or the social care crisis that's causing harm to people up and down this country. Scottish Liberal Democrats will vote against the budget tonight because the government has got its priorities all wrong. Thank you. Thank you. We now move to the open debate and I call Kenneth Gibson to be followed by Miles Briggs. And I'd like to warmly welcome the Cabinet Secretary's happy personal news. And I'm delighted to support the Scottish budget and pay tribute to Finance Secretary Kate Forbes, her ministerial team and officials who have all worked so hard to produce a detailed and positive budget for Scotland at a time of great financial challenge and uncertainty, all within the parameters of the limits set by the Independent Scottish Fiscal Commission and amidst the ongoing machinations of the Treasury. Investing £197 million in the new Scottish Child Payment, doubling it to £20 a week, three years ahead of schedule, amidst much muttering from the opposition, will make a huge difference to recipients, as indeed will £150 council tax grant to 173% uh, of our households. 
and as will continuing investment in the NHS, affordable, energy efficient housing, and a much more generous local government settlement than we see south of the border under the Tories. Despite their ludicrous attempts to be seen as the champions of our councils, I doubt even they believe it. And of course, we will see £840 over the next three years in new money being allocated to the National Care Service. Of course, no other party made any attempt whatsoever to provide an alternative budget. The Tories praise one-off consequences that won't, we hope, be clawed back by the Treasury, whilst asking for extended rates relief and increased local authority funding. Meanwhile, in England, Tory cuts to local government over the last decade amount to 37 per cent in real terms and continue. Yeah. Birmingham City Council has to make further cuts of £41 million in 2022-23, rising to £107 million by 2025-26. A headline in last Monday's Times read, Budget cuts mean 11 million rural potholes will go unfilled in England. And lamented a broken Tory manifesto promise to increase spending on council road maintenance by £500 million a year. Instead, from April, it will be cut in England by £480 million, a 40% cut in two years. Regarding Scotland, no attempt has been made to explain how much additional local authority funding the finance sector should deliver and from where in the budget it should be found. Indeed, when asked directly by Minister for Public Finance's Stage 1 debate what exact amount should be allocated to local authorities, all Douglas Lumsden could say in reply was, and I quote, I will easily set the budget whenever the government wants to move out of office. Woeful stuff. The SNP will be in government for at least another four years if the Tories want to be seen as even a competent opposition, let alone an alternative government, they really need to raise their game. I'd, be, I'd rather actually take interventions from one of the two major parties, if you don't mind, <laughs> Mr Rennie. Um, <coughs> we have local government elections coming, and the last time uh, we had them, uh, of the 96 council seats contested in Ayrshire, the Lib Dems had not won candidate. And in fact, the last time they contested a council seat in my constituency, they came 10th only because the Greens didn't have a candidate in that ward. Mr Briggs. Miles Briggs. Grateful for the <laughs> member for taking this intervention. Can he tell me what cuts his council will be facing to, due to this budget? Yeah. Kenneth Gibson. Council funding, as has been clearly expressed through the, uh, through the budget, and indeed it's 3.5% in North Ayrshire before the addition of the £120 million. Now, when Jerry Hassan wrote the strange death of Labour Scotland a few years ago, I doubt even he imagined the precipitous decline of that once dominant political force following years of indolence, incompetence and taking voters for granted. And yet at stage one we were given a stark demonstration of exactly why Labour has plummeted into its present rut as Scotland's third party here at Holyrood and fourth in terms of Scottish seats at Westminster. Following the Cabinet Secretary's confirmation of independent Scottish Fiscal Commission figures, that Rosal's budget will be reduced by 5.2% in real terms, while her capital allocation is slashed by 9.7%, courtesy of Westminster. What was Labour's reaction? To denounce the wicked Tories for cutting Scotland's funding at a time of rocket and inflation as we recover from Brexit and the pandemic? Not a bit of it. Daniel Johnson, Jackie Bailey, Pam Duncan Glancy and Paul Sweeney treated us to a tirade of invective against the SNP government with only a two-sentence whimper of a critique regarding the Tories being disingenuous from Daniel Johnson and not a word from the others. Becoming increasingly marginalised over the last two decades, Labour has declined from holding 53 to two Scottish Parliament constituencies, both only because of desperate appeals to Tory voters for tactical votes. So it's little wonder they fear to criticise UK Tory cuts when it's that party's both, uh, voters both Daniel Johnson and Jackie Berry rely on so heavily. The others have no such excuses. As with the Aberdeen Nine, it appears Labour is smoothing the path for lots of local deals involving the Better Together parties across our councils come May. Yeah. And as to their budget comments, calling them proposals would be a stretch. In evidence to the Finance and Public Administration Committee last week, the Finance Secretary diplomatically and politely advised the committee that she did not recall seeing costings. And there is certainly not capacity for anything in the region of £1.8 billion, the cost of the pay increase for care workers' labour demands. And only yesterday, Jackie Bailey submitted a motion calling for what she called a proper pay rise for nurses, without mentioning that Scottish nurses are the best paid in the UK, yeah. or the merest hint of what a proper pay rise might be, and how it could be funded. Their wish list for a budget the Cabinet Secretary has repeatedly made clear is fully allocated can only be met by cutting deep into other budget lines. And at committee nine days ago, Daniel Johnson offered to share his party's mythical costings, but alas, they have yet to appear. 
And what of this newfound budget-busting interest in care workers? We know when Labour left office in 2007, Scottish care workers were paid a measly £5.35 £5 an hour. Despite the financial crisis, austerity and rising demand, the SNP government has increased our rate to £10.50, a 96% increase over 15 years. Inflation over that period has been 45%, so more than twice the rate of rising prices. Our rates are higher under the SNP in Scotland, higher than Labour in Wales, higher than the Tories in England. And we recall in Glasgow, Labour spent millions on legal fees trying to deny female care workers and others equal pay. Presiding officer. Labour has never recovered from its humiliation in 2009 when it set out reasonable budget demands, all of which then Finance Secretary John Swinney met, only to have Labour then vote the budget down before crawling back a week later to vote for it, identically worded for favour and election. And now it seems that each year it cynically makes the most unaffordable demands as an excuse not to back an SNP budget. Can I gently suggest that if Labour wished to return to those halcyon days when they held more constituencies in Scotland and the Lib Dems, a more responsible and grown-up budget approach might help. Support the budget. Miles Briggs to be followed by Carol Morton. Uh, th thank you, Presiding Officer. And can I add my best wishes as well to those which have been already expressed uh, to the Cabinet Secretary? And I'd like to open my contribution, if I may, today uh, by thanking all those working across our public services for all of the hard work which they have put in, especially during the pandemic, to help support our families and our communities. And in the limited time I have today, I want to concentrate my comments on the social care crisis which councils are facing across Scotland and the delivery of the policy to extend free personal care to people under the age of 65. Because across Scotland, local authorities are warning us of the social care crisis which they face. Here in my own area in Edinburgh City, that crisis has now become acute. Just this week, it was reported that council staff have been asked to volunteer or to go on secondment to help plug the gap in the social care workforce here in the capital. I'm disappointed that the minister has left the chamber on this issue uh, because I would like an intervention on this if he was here. Because the report is quite clear from the Edinburgh uh, Integrated Joint Board, which oversees health and social care services here in the capital, that there is a crisis. In fact, arrangements between September and December saw 83 people across the capital not receiving uh, services and for that to be addressed um, and for a total number of 14 hours of care needing to be now provided uh, by outside agencies. It was noted the extreme distress this has had on many people and their families. So the social care crisis, uh, which the, ca the Cabinet Secretary hasn't mentioned in her speech today, I think is one which we should all be looking at. Yes, happy to. Cabinet Secretary. A few quick points um, to the member. The first is that that's precisely why we've increased the amount of funding overall for the local government settlement. And whenever the Conservatives and other parties uh, talk about cuts to local government, they are excluding all the additional funding that we've actually provided for social care because they exclude it for some strange reason from the overall settlement as though it's not part of local government's uh, commitments. But secondly, in terms of ensuring that that money reaches its allocated um, intention, that's why we say that health and social care funding is for social care. And I hope that the member would actually accept and agree with that position. Miles Briggs. Uh, well, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that, but that actually doesn't go away from the fact which I'm talking about, that under her government, under this government budget, SNP Green government budget, Edinburgh will receive the lowest funding uh, per head, both in terms of our council, but also our health board. And that is doing nothing to help address this social care crisis here in the capital. Now, there has been a long time growing concern over ministers' plans to destabilise services further and the potential impact uh, which could undermine fragile local services and accountability and make this difficult situation even worse. As my colleague Lisbeth stated, there are serious concerns being raised about the top-down restructuring and redevelopment of a national care service. The total restructuring of social care in Scotland will be hugely destabilising. We need to accept that and present many significant challenges and considerable additional costs to our local authorities uh, as well. Scotland doesn't need a national care service. It needs SNP and Green Ministers to properly fund local care services. And that brings me to the policy of extending free personal care to people under the age of 65, something I've campaigned on in the last Parliament and something which I'm passionate that we actually see fully delivered. Now, I have to say that I'm more than disappointed and concerned at the lack of progress which we've seen to deliver this policy to extend free personal care and the increasing secrecy 
uh, which we've seen around this policy. The Scottish Government committed to deliver the extension of free personal care, known as Frank's Law, in 2019. However, no data has been provided on how that actually has been delivered. I spoke with Amanda Capel, who is Frank's wife, this week, and she told me that she is concerned that after two years and eight months, almost three years, Frank's Law was initially implemented um, and the campaign that she has fought on this, that there still is no figures around the uptake of this policy. COVID cannot be used as an excuse for these discrepancies which have been made uh, around the proper implementation across all our councils of this policy. And as she said, I and many thousands of Frank Law supporters do not want to think that our six-year battle for justice, fairness and equality was all in vain. I agree. The Scottish Government promised £30 million to councils in 2019 in that budget to deliver this policy. Written questions, freedom of information requests have not been able to obtain how much of that has actually been provided to councils and indeed how many people have actually been given access to the care and support that they need and now have a legal right to receive. Now, given the problems which we've seen during the pandemic for people accessing care packages, and in fact many being removed or these, uh, these packages being cut for individuals, it is concerning that more and more are, are reporting that people with complex needs and life-limiting conditions are not getting that vital care. And I hope that in future budgets, this becomes one of our main focuses in protecting and delivering free personal care, as all parties have supported. Because it's vital that we do see the full restoration of care packages and assessments for personal care across Scotland. It's clear that the pre-pandemic pressures on social care services are only going to increase as we see a post-pandemic environment as well. Now, I hope that this debate will see um, us all focus, as I've said in the future, on social care services and the crisis across Scotland, but especially here in the capital for people I represent in the Parliament. That's why I'm disappointed that Ministers have not agreed to my proposal to convene a national recovery group. We desperately need that and we desperately need to see national leadership on this issue, something which this budget today is lacking. And I support the amendment in my colleague Liz Smith's name. Thank you. Thank you. I call Carol Mockham to be followed by John Mason. Thank you, Presiding Officer. <clears throat> this is a budget lacking in ambition and full of the usual unnecessary compromises that leave people wondering why public funds are not being utilised effectively to help us recover from the pandemic and tackle the looming cost of living crisis. It simply doesn't help individuals enough. There is little to offer our hard-working NHS and social care workforce. And on top of that, councils are being left to suffer once again as the government passes difficult decisions down the line and forces local authorities to take on yet another round of real term cuts. COSLA suggests real term core funding cuts amounting to 371 million of lost funds. A story my council colleagues have been forced to hear year after year. And I will be interested to speak to the councillors on the ground from all parties about the announcements that are made and about the way in which the budget process is conducted. But we do know that local government funding means that many of the targets and priorities around care, exercise, social isolation that this government bring to this chamber in various reports week after week will never get off the starting block in those local communities. Local authorities simply do not have the capacity to meet the needs of their populations and cannot commit to funding beyond the very basic of provision. They cannot commit to funding around additional care, exercise in green space areas, housing improvements, roads, bin collections. They cannot afford them. I hear from council colleagues all of the time and residents about the lack of local services. Yet again, though, this government simply do not listen. Conveniently, the government will blame councils, claiming they have the choice to prioritise what they deem suitable, indeed to raise their own revenue in some cases. But in reality, it is the decisions made here in this chamber that will be fatal for large chunks of locally run services. Yeah. Presiding officer, by April, many people will see their energy costs rising by as much as 50 per cent. For even relatively comfortable families, that is a serious load to bear. And for those who are already living from month to month, it is potentially life-destroying. 
I understand that the £290 million announced by the Chancellor will go towards this, this, and this is, of course, welcome and the correct thing to do. But the £290 million should not lead to a squeeze on other expenditure in Scotland's budget, and it should not be assumed that it is even close to enough for these families. I join with my colleagues in calling for an additional £400 payment to be given to those families who will be hit the hardest by this crisis. These ballooning energy costs caused by poor energy infrastructure planning, governments putting profit before people, and greedy oil and gas companies who clearly have done everything in their powers to lobby those at the top against Labour's windfall tax on their profits will disproportionately impact the most vulnerable. I think for most people around the country, such profitable and gigantic companies should be made to pay more towards the country they benefit from. A windfall tax is justified and the right action to take. I am glad the First Minister appears to have now backed something similar to this, although it is, off, it is as is often the case, unclear exactly what she is backing. But it would also be most helpful if she could make her MPs do the same and walk into the lobbies to support people over profit. Presiding officer, this budget is simply not enough to even meet the government's own child poverty targets to fund our councils. And I do not need to reiterate the very cogent points made by my colleagues, colleagues at stage one about education, health and social care. I come back to a point I raised earlier about our undervalued social care staff, a severely low-paid workforce. What I will say is that the very least the Scottish Government should be committing to a £15 minimum wage for social care staff who have worked especially hard during the pandemic and have not been valued by this Government. Scottish Labour have costed an immediate £12 an hour rise, rising to £15 an hour. Yes. Cameron Secretary. How much that would cost? Karen Mochan. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, the, Scottish, the Labour Party have costed this out, and we have had this discussion before. It is about choices. If this government had the political will to do it, it would do it. Now. <laughs> Um, excuse me, Ms Malkin, could you receive a seat? Could we just let us hear Ms Malkin in our closing minute or so? Thank you. On the NHS, where is the ambitious funding to help our NHS recover and stop so many staff leaving? We know that a recent report indicated six in ten nursing professionals are thinking of leaving the NHS at a time when we can ill afford to lose them. Urgent action is needed from this government to value and maintain NHS staff numbers. In closing, presiding officer, I have to say without a commitment to funding our councils, to paying our social care staff properly and giving our NHS the resources it needs and deserves, it is impossible for anyone committing to help Scotland recover from the pandemic to back this budget. Presiding officer, the budget represents a government bereft of ideas, a lack of desire to support those most in need, and it simply is just not enough. I must say I was hoping for an intervention from the member across and I hope that he will be joining me on Saturday to campaign and fight to stop the cost of living crisis in Glasgow or Edinburgh on Saturday. Thank you, presiding officer. Thank you. I now call on John Mason to be followed by Ross Creer. Hey, thank you very much, hey, presiding officer. I appreciate the opportunity to speak on the budget again today. And as I was preparing, I thought I hate to think that Murdo Fraser would be bored with my repeating myself. <laughs> Uh, again today by saying that we can only spend the money we have and demands for further spending by the Conservatives or anyone else are pretty pointless if we do not know where the money is coming from. However, uh, perhaps I can change tack a bit today by focusing more on some of the good things that are coming out of this budget. And firstly, for me, one of these is housing. And I particularly welcome £831 million for affordable housing. Now, I get the point that we need to invest in many other things, like schools and a whole range of other less tangible assets, which are important for the future. However, I still think there is something incredibly important about investing in bricks and mortar, and I always get a boost when I see a new housing development in my constituency. 
A new affordable home can mean an overcrowded family who could not afford to heat some old drafty damp building are able to move into a modern home which is easier and cheaper to heat, perhaps to passive house standards, and where the young people have an opportunity and a space to study. Again, we see investment in public transport and active travel, and I very much welcome the investment of £1,396 million pounds in rail, £413 million pounds on buses, including concessionary fares, and £150 million pounds on active travel. I'd like us just to think about the amount we support the rail industry. That is £258 per person, by my calculations. Now, members know that I'm very much in favour of rail, but I think it is worth emphasising just how much is being invested. Every person in this country, whether with a train line or not, pays £258 for the railways each year. And maintaining rail, as well as other public transport, continues to be a challenge because of COVID with passenger numbers still around only 50% of pre-pandemic, and fares income is down in line with that. It's all very well for some opposition parties saying they want increased services despite the lack of passenger demand. They want lower fares, more routes, and better terms and conditions for the staff. But all of these come at a cost. Of course, we do, we do want people to switch from car to rail, but at the same time, we cannot afford to run trains with hardly any passengers on them. Buses are also clearly important, carrying many more passengers than trains do. But passenger numbers have been declining over a number of years in Glasgow and the west of Scotland. Ownership of buses may be a factor, but I do not believe it is the major one. Lothian Buses told us that they would run in very much the same way whoever owned them. Rather, in the west of Scotland, we have an excellent local train service, and clearly the buses struggle to compete on speed and comfort, even though the buses are cheaper and in fact free for some people. Having said that, I do very much welcome the £110 million to give free bus travel for under 22s. Hopefully this will get more young people into the habit of using the bus, and so in due course they will become paying passengers. Again, we could mention health, another area where we can welcome the spending of £12.9 billion for health boards as part of the total £18 billion budget. Doubling the Scottish Child Payment from April, costing £197 million, is hugely good news and hopefully will make a big impact on where child poverty would have been like otherwise. For local government, the extra £120 million announcement is very welcome and hopefully gives our councils a bit more room for manoeuvre. I know they would certainly like more certainty further ahead, as would a number of other sectors, including colleges and universities. However, that in turn brings up the question of how much certainty the Scottish Government and we in the Scottish Parliament have about our funding. And the answer to that is not very much. Even today, we have heard from the Cabinet Secretary about the lack of certainty she has on UK funding announcements. Is the £290 million to tackle increased energy costs new money, or is it a reallocation from existing budgets? That makes a huge difference as to our spending ability. Here we are at stage three of the budget for next year, and we are still very uncertain about the budget for this year. And that is not even to mention the problem we have had in several recent years of having to start our budget process before Westminster has formally started theirs. I do not want to get into the fiscal framework in this debate today, but it would help all of us hugely if Westminster would set its budget during the autumn so that we would then have a better idea of where we stood. The budget seeks both to maintain current public services, but also to do new things like the child payment and more childcare, and that is not an easy balance to strike. It's always a tension. Should we pay existing workers more, or should we expand services and take on new workers? Should we make existing train lines better, or should we create new lines? There are no easy answers to these questions, and somehow we have to try to do both. But I do, th I do think that this budget does make a good attempt to do what it can on both fronts. We see continuing finance for valuable existing services in health, local government, and elsewhere but we also see expansion into significant new areas. So overall, I'm happy to support this budget. We would all like to do more in a whole range of sectors, but just like every individual and every organisation in Scotland, we have a limited amount of money available, and I consider that this budget does well at using our resources wisely and effectively. So I hope all parties will see the huge benefits coming from this budget and will support it at decision time, as I certainly will be doing. Thank you. 
Thank you. I now call Ross Greer to be followed by Michelle Thompson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And like colleagues, I'd like to pass on my and my party's congratulations to the Cabinet Secretary on her husband. Uh, I would also like to uh, observe to Liz Smith that I've certainly been called many things in, in my political career. I'm sure the Cabinet Secretary has as well. But I'm intrigued by the notion that a process based in large part on dialogue between myself and Kate Forbes could uh, be described as unholy. Uh, the, uh, the, the, the Minister for Zero Carbon Buildings did observe to me a moment ago that perhaps if he'd been leading for the Greens in these discussions, unholy may have been a more apt description. Uh, the, the budget process in this Parliament is far more compressed than members and committees would like, as, as John Mason's just noticed. But even in the relatively brief period between publication of the first draft uh, and this final debate, the world around us has not for the first time changed significantly. A global energy crisis and a complete failure on the UK government's part to regulate our domestic energy market means that almost every household in Scotland faces a huge rise in our energy bills. For many, this will be completely unpayable. It will force families into crisis and without radical action, as the Cabinet Secretary said at the weekend, the Cabinet Secretary for Energy said at the weekend, some people will die. But at the very same time, the very same energy companies whose gas runs through our network are laughing all the way to the bank, reporting billions of pounds in net profits. BP and Shell made a combined £44,000 of net profits a minute in 2021. With a single step, a windfall tax on the profits of oil and gas companies, the UK government could raise the money needed to help families through this difficult period. And I hope that all parties in this Parliament and in Westminster recognise the growing public demand for this very just tax on obscene profits. I welcome the Finance Secretary's announcement today that the Scottish Government is doing what it can to support families, particularly given the revelation that the £290 million of additional funding the UK Government claimed was coming to Scotland largely does not exist. This is on top of the measures already in this budget which support family incomes, the doubling of the transformational Scottish child payment, free bus travel for young people, increasing funding for, uh, funding for family income maximisation projects, increasing pay for care workers, delivering free school meals for all primary one to five pupils and funding the capital investment needed to roll that out to primary six and seven as soon as possible. On home energy and fuel bills in particular, I'm proud of the role that the Greens are playing in government to drive forward energy efficiency and decarbonisation programmes that will both reduce emissions and reduce household fuel bills. The £160 million already earmarked to support those who would otherwise be unable to pay for energy improvements for their homes will clearly be essential. And I hope the plans for deploying it are currently being revisited to ensure that money is going out the door and resulting in home energy improvements as soon as possible. Supporting people to pay their surging bills in the short term is obviously critical now. But this budget reflects the priority that we are putting on reducing the amount of energy people need to heat their home in the first place and decarbonising the sources of that energy. The new low-income winter heating assistance programme will also be hugely important this year. But again, I'd ask the government to consider if plans for how it's deployed might be adapted to reflect the energy crisis that we now face. The Warmer Home Scheme is another whose importance is now far greater than previously envisaged. But given the circumstances, I think there's probably merit in revisiting and widening the eligibility for that scheme. Expanding the advice capacity of Home Energy Scotland would also seem sensible at this point. I say all of this knowing the huge pressure on the Scottish Government. The context of a 5% real terms cut from Westminster is still true. And the developments around this £290 million of money that never was has again demonstrated that the fiscal framework simply isn't working. And opposition parties have now proposed, I think, something in the region of £3 billion of additional spending. I think it's gone up in the course of this debate. Uh, but there's absolutely no credible accompanying proposals for where that money would come from. So I return to the point that I made during the rates resolution debate. We need to change how the budget is developed, scrutinised and debated in this parliament. All parties should be given the opportunity to, all parties should be expected to, confirm at least some of their taxation proposals each year. Spending proposals without revenue raising or reallocation proposals should not be taken seriously. Yes. Daniel Johnson. Yeah, I, I very much thank the member for giving me and I agree with the need for a better budget proposal, but we also accept that if you look at last year's budget as passed, compared to the resource funding available this year, and if we as assume correctly or, or that take on good faith that the government didn't use Barnet consequentials for COVID on recurring items, that left £3 billion difference unallocated going into the budget, not more money than last year, 
but certainly three billion unallocated from last year's budget going into the, sorry, the current year's budget going into next year's budget. I thank the member for the intervention, but I do not recognise his characterisation, both of the, the way that underspend is calculated, but also uh, of the way COVID uh, consequentials are deployed. There is a difference between one-off and recurring spending as a result of COVID. The example I gave during the Stage 1 debate was the amount of money that is uh, having to be spent this year on keeping public transport operators continuing. Now, that goes into our core funding. We hope that will not be needed on a recurring basis, but it's certainly needed this year, and it comes out of the core budget as a result of the COVID consequentials for it being withdrawn. I think all parties putting forward at least some spending proposals, uh, some taxation raising proposals rather, would be better for government and for opposition in the course of this debate. But this budget, uh, I think I'm about to close. Uh, there's so a wee bit of time in hand, should you wish to take the intervention? Uh, in that case, yes, please. Uh, I thank Mr Greer for taking the intervention. Is he in favour of going back to a system where we have three-year uh, projections on budgets? And would he also agree to the possibility of a finance bill that is better for in terms of scrutinising where expenditure lies? Ross Greer. Thank you. And I'm grateful to the member for that intervention. I think, and someone can intervene to correct me if I'm wrong, I think all parties in this parliament would prefer if we were able to do multi-annual budgeting. I think three-year budgeting is something that we would all support if we were in the position to do that. We're in the position this year as a result of the UK spending review that we can look a little bit further forward. If we had more certainty from the UK government, I would certainly strongly support three-year budgeting. But that's not possible under the current arrangements that this parliament faces on an annual basis. This budget, though, is based on three strategic choices made by the Scottish Government. That's why the Greens are supporting it. Those are choices made in the programme for government and in the cooperation agreement between our parties which underpin it. We've chosen to tackle child poverty, climate action and COVID recovery as those shared strategic objectives. That's reflected, for example, in the £150 million for active travel, the £300 million for bus services, the £6 million for the Climate Justice Fund, £200 million for tackling the poverty-related attainment gap. The Greens are proud to vote for a budget that reflects these strategic priorities, and we would urge all parties in this Parliament to seriously consider what they might be voting against at decision time. Thank you. Thank you. I now call Michelle Thompson to be followed by Jamie Huckle Johnson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, and I think we can all agree that the backdrop to this budget has been extremely challenging. Uh, we've got considerable uncertainties. We've talked about rapidly rising inflation, a cost of living crisis, energy price hikes, and so on. And against this backdrop, we have to acknowledge that the UK government have added their own challenges for the Scottish government with a constant changing of reliable consequential figures and fundamentally a lack of respect for this parliament. The response of the UK Treasury to the wider economic conditions remains unclear. And the Bank of England started a process of regular interest rate rises, and although it's received little comment in this Parliament, it's setting out a path of unwinding quantitative easing. And the consequences of that no one can be certain of, I suspect, not least of all the Bank of England. And of course, this backdrop, which is very important for us to understand, of course leads to pressure to increase government expenditure on every front. And no area has been immune from these pressures. And we've heard today the multiple calls from across this chamber to raise department allocations and expenditure in virtually everything. But again, it cannot be overstressed that the Cabinet Secretary and her ministerial team face all these pressures with a largely fixed budget. And someone coming into this chamber for the first time cannot understand why it's so hard for the opposition parties to understand this. The calls for increased expenditure are simply not matched by suggestions of where budget cuts should be made. And the opposition seem to imagine that there actually is a magic money tree after all. One further issue about which I've spoken before is the uncertainty and fast-changing forecasts with which the Scottish Government has to contend. The OBR forecast determined the size of the block grant adjustments for both devolved taxes and welfare benefits, and the, the, the SFC forecasts affect the tax revenues and welfare spending. And this is a headache, and more so if outcomes are significantly different from the forecast, and as the Cabinet Secretary has already pointed out, with a limited ability to carry forward. So then, the question for me is, how should we judge the budget? And perhaps there is a test. Amidst this background and the challenges, has the government come up with a balanced, fair and proportionate set of proposals? Furthermore, is there flexibility to allow for adjustments as circumstances evolve? And as a member of both the Finance and Economy Committees, 
I think the Cabinet Secretary and her ministerial team have done a quite frankly remarkable job to satisfy these tests. The scrutiny of the budget by the Finance and Public Administration Committee was detailed and thorough given the time and resources available. Our report identifies the importance and challenges of the fiscal framework and of the negotiations taking place. Amongst the evidence we examined, I was impressed by the paper Options for Reforming the Devolved Fiscal Frameworks Post-Pandemic, authored by the three Davids, Professor David Bell, David Phillips and David Iser. They argued persuasively for increased flexibilities in borrowing and reserve drawdowns in normal times. They also sought the reintroduction of funding guarantees and extended borrowing powers during times of rapid change and adverse shocks such as we have been experiencing with the COVID-19 pandemic. Scrutiny of a budget can become dauntingly technical, but we cannot forget the need for transparency and clarity for the citizens of Scotland. Rather than asking about the intricacy of the fiscal framework, they might ask, probably encouraged by the media, why for 2020 to 2021 there was a £580 million underspend. And asked about this during an evidence session, the Cabinet Secretary responded with her typical clarity and candour. I quote, it is illegal for me to overspend. Therefore, as we get closer to the end of the financial year, coming in under budget is a bit like landing on a 747 on a postage stamp. In other words, that is a function of a quite ridiculous process of how we need to manage our budget. And I have tweeted earlier today, you wouldn't run a business like this, so why are we expected to run our country like this? <laughs> now, I've already had my say on tax during the tax resolution debate. However, from some of the earlier comments earlier from the Tories, I notice that the Tories still failed to pick up on the fact, as quoted last week by the Spotlight on Corruption report, that £290 billion every year is lost to UK GDP as a result of corruption. Last week, I called on Murdo Fraser to condemn that. He did not. Perhaps he might like to do that today. Murdo Fraser. An intervention. Uh, that. Would you like to do that? Well, would the member like to take an intervention or not? I'd be delighted. Murdo Fraser. Would the, member, would the member like to condemn all the wastage we've seen in the Scottish Government, which my colleague Liz Smith outlined in detail earlier in this debate? Michelle Thompson. Presiding officer, he's beginning to sound a bit like Boris Johnson and he won't condemn it. So allow me to close by reflecting an important aspect of expenditure. The budget for 2022 to 2023 gives emphasis to the importance of preventative spend across a range of areas from health to the environment. And of course, that's also related to the need for reform. And I strongly agree, agree with the view of Professor Graham Roy when he told our committee that the resource spending review provides an opportunity to undertake a significant review of how public services are delivered. And he went on to say this would involve difficult choices, but that is ultimately what the government has to do. And in tackling such difficult choices amidst the current economic conditions, I commend the budget and congratulate the Cabinet Secretary and her team on their efforts on behalf of the people of Scotland. Thank you. Thank you. I now call on Jamie Halcrow Johnson to be followed by Paul McLennan. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I add my congratulations to the Cabinet Secretary and to her husband Ali on their very wonderful news? Um, over the past two years, we have lived through a global crisis that would be almost unimaginable had we not experienced it. At times, it's brought nations to a standstill, it's emptied our streets of people, and it's led to restrictions on our citizens that we have never seen before and I hope we never see again. Scotland's economy has been hit hard, but many people and many families have been kept afloat through a combination of government support and their own resilience. How we live our lives has changed too. Many trends, increasing online shopping, more remote working, and cash-free uh, transactions have been accelerated by the pandemic. This combined with changing rules, closures, and disruptions to supply chains has stretched people, businesses, and the state. Our collective resilience has been battered, but has not been broken. It goes without saying that government must be responsive to this change. It calls for an ambitious programme of recovery, an aspiration, if I can use that perhaps overused phrase, to build back better. 
Sadly, this budget falls short in almost every way. Councils who are still guide, the guiding hand for many of the services that matter most to people, schools, social care, housing, transport, are once again the ones facing the sharp edge of decisions made in St Andrew's House. Over the last couple of months, we've witnessed the now familiar sight of swinging cuts, accumulating year on year, announced to local government, then followed by some undiscovered spare cash to sweeten the bitter pill. It's why we see these vital services ever stretched or downgraded or abandoned altogether. And it is difficult not to assume that the reason these cuts fall to councils is the hope that they, rather than the Scottish Government, will get the blame. We've heard something about the creation of a national care service. But beyond a title and the odd high cost externally commissioned report, there are a few solid proposals on how we will fix the crisis in our care sector. Instead of offering support, the Scottish Government is offering an approach that worries many councils who see this move as potentially damaging, one which risks centralising an approach to care and ignoring the distinct needs of communities, particularly those in my Highlands and Islands region. And this is also a budget that fails to help, the bus uh, help business recover. Across the Highlands and Islands, we've seen an extremely mixed recovery for tourism and hospitality. Yet phase two of the tourism recovery plan has been shelved, never to see the light of day. And the Scottish Tourism Alliance has said that the budget has gone not nearly far enough in supporting recovery. I, su I suspect that that may be polite compared to what constituents in the sector would be telling the Finance Secretary in private. In our countryside, we are seeing 4.4 million removed from agricultural support. And all the while, the budget for Highlands and Islands Enterprise, the body responsible for supporting business growth and new business creation, gets cut. And instead of targeted help, the government's approach to recent support schemes seems to be little more than arbitrary, ignoring the impact of the winter public health measures on a whole range of businesses. These benches called for 75% targeted business rates for a full year. What this budget offers is paltry in comparison. We now know that one part of the Scottish Government, the Scottish Greens, doesn't even believe in growing the economy. But it seems increasingly that this has now infected the SNP too. And so it is no surprise that the fiscal outlook for shows Scotland have lagging a good quarter behind the rest of the UK in the timing of economic recovery. So where is the change? Where are the big ideas? Where is the aspiration to rebuild? We were promised much through the pandemic. A skills-led recovery was one of those notions addressing not only the issues of the pandemic, but one of the long-term drags on economic and productivity growth across Scotland. But instead, we see a skills and training budget cut. We see funding for colleges, already a victim of years of SNP ground downgrading, cut by £53 million. Pounds. Presiding officer, on any honest assessment, this is a budget that fails to live up to the requirements of today's circumstances or even to those future aspirations we all should share for our country. It's a budget that not only dodges the big questions, but actively serves to undermine progress against the long-term challenges that Scotland faces. But above all, it's a budget that shows a deep complacency in the Scottish Government, a government which, if the recent upsurge in discussion about breaking up the United Kingdom is anything to go by, has got tired of the day-to-day -day business of governing. It's a budget that will leave the Highlands and Islands worse off, it's a budget that will leave Scotland worse off. But it's not too late for SNP and Green, MS, Green MSPs to put their constituents first and reject it. And I would urge them to do that today. Thank you. And I now call on Paul McLennan, who will be the last speaker in the open debate. Mr McLennan. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. And can I also pass my best wishes on to the Cabinet Secretary on our fantastic news I am um, delighted to speak in this stage three debate this afternoon to pass the Scottish Government budget. I want to speak on the economic situation in Scotland we have at this time. I do so at the time of crisis and at the time of economic upheaval. We have heard before about the cost of living crisis. Our poorest families have already had to deal with a universal credit cut. This affected 8,000 families in my constituency, alone with 5,000 single parent families affected. In the UK, fuel cost increases will see the energy cap rise from 1,277 to 1,971, a rise of £693. That is nearly £60 a month, which will impact the most vulnerable in our society. Yet, in France, price hikes were limited to 4%. In Spain, the government introduced a windfall tax on electricity generators and gas producers. And in Germany, 
the government slashed the surcharge on bills to support renewables. The general government will support them by increasing state subsidies drawn from higher carbon taxes. These were all policy choices, policy choices available to the UK government. On national insurance, the average rise will be around about £350 a year, £30 a month. Inflation is expected to hit over 7% later this year, and food bills are soaring. Interest rates also look set to rise sharply. For many who are working poor, the combined rise in costs could range from anything from £100 to £350 per month. These are people who are already struggling. In my constituency, food bank usage was up 40% in December and 28% in January. No surprise that the biggest rise for years was following the universal credit cut. Most food bank users in East Berlin are people on low income. The cost of living crisis is caused by the UK government policy choices on universal credit, policy choices on energy, and policy choices and national insurance. These are all coming home to roost. Make no mistake, these impact the poorest in society. These are Westminster decisions. Now, we hear the Tories talk about we need to grow our economy, but let's look at another Tory policy choice, Brexit, which has given the, econ the economy its, big its biggest hit, even bigger than COVID. Yet we hear not a word mentioned about this in, in the, uh, op the benches opposite today. Only yesterday, one of Scotland's biggest trading partners, Germany, reported import of goods from the UK dropped 8.5% in year-to-year -year trading figures, whilst the rest of Europe surged, surged by 17.1%. The UK now, for the first time, is out Germany's top five trading partners for the first time ever. And yesterday, the UK Public uh, Accounts Committee said, and I quote, the only detectable sign of Brexit fast so far is to be increased burdens on business through higher costs, more red tape and border delays. And let's come back and let's remind everybody of what the Scottish Fiscal Commission said in their forecast. Overall, the Scottish budget in 2022-23 is 2.6% lower than 2021-22, and after accounting for inflation, the reduction is 5.2%. Now, we will hear from the Scottish Tories this is all about grievance politics. The UK government has been very generous. Yet yeah, on Tuesday, Mark Drakeford, Labour First Minister, said, and I quote, Last week, the UK Treasury said Wales will receive £175 million from its English Council tax rebate plan. Just as we are finalising our plans to tackle the cost of living crisis, we have learned there is no extra money for Wales. Surprise, surprise. We will continue to work to support those who need it most. Now, how ironic that the Welsh First Minister stands up more for the devolved budgets than his Scottish Labour Party colleagues. Now, that sounds familiar. Tories naturally do not like devolution, nor will they ever. So we've talked about the, the Tory created backdrop. What is the Scottish Government going to do to help? I welcome the cost of living measures taken by the Cabinet Secretary today. The Scottish Government has provided funding to business more than the UK Government consequentials provided. The Scottish Government's latest business support package of £375 million would equate to £4.6 billion UK equivalent package, far exceeding the Chancellor's £1 billion of funding announced in December. On the finance and economy portfolio budget, this will provide £1.75 billion pounds and will support the Scottish Government's economic response with a firm commitment to build a net zero wellbeing economy and protect and create good quality green jobs across every region of Scotland. This budget will support economic recovery, protecting the resource budgets of Scotland's three enterprise agencies and Visit Scotland. It will also capitalise on opportunities created by the green economy while strengthening Scotland's pandemic recovery and is a major focus of this budget. To accelerate the potential of digital technology, £192 million has been allocated to improve connectivity and boost the digital economy. Yeah? I'm, I'm interested about the, the, the advances in digital because, uh, as we all know, the R100 scheme, which is managed completely by the Scottish Government, is uh, years behind schedule. So, you know, what does he think of that? Paul McLennan. The, the R100 scheme was picked up by the Scottish Government because of inadequacy the UK Government did other than what they were doing. I'm not going to take lectures on that, I'm sorry. The spending plans also maintain the Scotch, the spending plans also maintain the Scottish Government's non-domestic rate, uh, rate, uh, rates relief package and will also save ratepayers more than £800 million and includes the Small Business Bonus Rate Scheme, which takes over 111,000 properties out of rates altogether and is the most generous relief package in the whole of the UK. I see this every single day in the high streets in East Lothian. In 2021-22, retail, hospitality and leisure businesses received 100% rates relief, meaning they pay nothing until April 22 while equivalent businesses in England started paying rates last July. Other budget funding for 2022-23 included £215 billion for the Scottish National Investment Bank to enable it to invest in existing and emerging sustainable businesses. And I've seen that through Sunamp in my constituency in East Lothian. 
£370 million for Scotland's enterprise agencies, up from £340 million last year, and £225 million for Skills Development Scotland to support a range of national training interventions. A further £45 million will also support the Young Persons Guarantee targeting employment support for young people who face longer-term scanning effects from the pandemic through new and enhanced employment and training opportunities. Presenting officer, in conclusion, this is a budget for business recovery, business growth, business renewal and jobs. I am proud to support this budget this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. And we will now move to closing statements. And I would take this opportunity to advise members that there is some time in hand uh, for extended contributions and or interventions, should the closing speakers so wish. And I call on Daniel Johnson to wind up for Scottish Labour. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And I'll, I'll try not to note the disappointment of members' faces when uh, I'm rising to send that, having, you having just said that. Yeah. Uh, but can I, can I begin by saying that we've become used to, if not weary, with finance secretaries making unexpected last-minute announcements as we conclude the budget process. But can I say that the unexpected announcement that she made the other day was very welcome indeed. And, and genuinely, can I offer my congratulations to both her and her husband. Parenthood is genuinely a blessing and a joy most of the time. Um, but this, so let me turn to the budget. This budget comes at an important time, as I think we all recognise and indeed hope that we're entering a new phase uh, of uh, the virus, one where I think we can genuinely start to look towards recovery rather than just dealing with the emergency. And yes, we can all agree that, that the COVID costs haven't gone away, but recovery, I think, means going further than simply accounting for those costs. It means saying what action we will take in order to build that recovery. So what this budget needed to do was set out clear plans to help our shattered public services get back to normal, to help businesses get back to trading, to help uh, our school children uh, recover the learning that they have lost. And while there are many things in this budget we can support, such as the doubling of the child payment, what I would argue is that there is sufficient uh, focus, sufficient clarity on those detailed steps to build recovery, not just deal with COVID. And that's where this budget falls short. Now, there's been a lot of hot uh, air, a lot of heat and argument about what the opposition parties may or may not have been saying. Now, let me just set this out very clearly in numbers. Last year's budget, at the point it was passed, was £37.8 billion in terms of resource funding. That included £1.8 billion of COVID, non-recurring COVID spending. The COVID money rose to 4.6, but compared to the £39.2 billion of resource spending in the coming year's budget, that left three billion unallocated. Now, yes, that's less money overall if you include non-recurring COVID money. But that non-recurring point is important because that money was unallocated in this coming budget. So we set out proposals within that envelope of three billion pounds that would deliver recovery. Now, the government's contention is that the cost of just running services because of COVID more than exceeds that three billion. That may be, but I don't think they have demonstrated that in clarity. So I make no apologies for setting out proposals in detail. And can I say politely to Kenny Gibson, if he wants to accept invitations, he needs to actually do that. And if he'd got back in touch with me, I would literally have sat down with my dossier and gone line by line. And likewise, each of my, each, just, just in a moment, Mr. Swinney, if I could just finish the point. And each one of those proposals was published with detailed costings. They, they may be wrong, and, but I would be happy for him to sit down with me and point out where they're wrong. Mr Swinney, I'd be delighted to take uh, I'm, I'm, very, I'm very grateful to uh, Mr Johnson for giving way, but he completely misses the point that we've reached in the budget process. The Finance Secretary has allocated the budget in its entirety, including the supposed £3 billion about which Mr Johnson is talking just now. If he wishes to allocate money to some other purpose, he has to serve Parliament well by telling us where, in the pro proposals put forward by the Cabinet Secretary, he is going to move the money from. Because yeah. it's just incredible to come here and say he's got, he wants to spend £1.5 billion over on this side without saying where in the allocated budget the money is going to come from. And that's the credibility problem the Labour Party failed today. And it's why it's no justification for turning their backs on the young people of Scotland and the children of Scotland by not supporting the doubling of the child payment. Daniel Johnson. 
and Mr Swinney has got his secret signals put out of order. At the point we made the claims was before the budget, because the birth of the budget was... was no, let, and let, well, if you would just wait a, a moment. The key point, though, is that since the public budget has been published, there are two fatal flaws which is that you cannot build recovery in social care, recovery that is needed if we're going to deal with the problem of backlog, on low pay. Simply raising the, the pay of social care workers by 48 pence, I would contend is a problem because we will not be able to recruit and retain the social care workers we need to deal with that backlog. We can't vote for a budget that does that, nor can we vote, vote for a budget that treats council services Absolutely. as a budget line to be raided to be redistributed elsewhere, as opposed to council services, which are the foundation of recovery, not something to be expended in, in the cause of recovery, the foundation of recovery, because we need roads, we need schools, we need libraries, we need play parks. We can't afford to cut them if we want a recovery worthy of the name. Now, when it, of course, since uh, the budget was first introduced in December, the, the, we, the cost of living crisis has come to uh, dominate uh, headlines. And it simply underlines the challenge the, challenge the recovery poses. Um, and and in, in recent weeks, we have heard, in recent days, we have heard the profits of multinational oil and gas companies are spiralling. BP announcing £9.5 billion worth of profits. Uh, Shell announcing £14 billion worth of profits. And at a time where Labour comes forward with a proposal to tax those profits, to use those profits to alleviate the cost of living, what do SNP MPs do? They vote with the Tories to vote those proposals down. Well, quite frankly, I think that is shameful. If you, if you can explain why SNP MPs voted with the Tories against those proposals, I'd be happy to take the intervention. Kenneth Gibson. All Labour voting for £30 billion in cuts before you lost 40 of your 41 MPs back in yeah, 2015. Yeah. But we're talking about the Scottish budget today. That's a reserved matter. Are you saying you believe Scotland should have the powers in order to be able to decide whether or not to have a windfall tax? And as for the invite, uh, 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 Daniel, it seems to have got lost in the post because I've never received it. Daniel well, Johnson. I'll tell you what's been lost in the post. It's whether the SNP agree that we can talk about reserve matters or not. And we can agree that we can talk about what MPs do in Westminster or not, because there's a huge amount of inconsistency going on from over there. Now, that plan that they voted against would have given most households £200 off their annual bills and delivered a targeted support to the hardest hit by increasing the warm homes discount, meaning 815,000 households receiving £600 off their bills if you include the plans both across the UK and in Scotland. Now, I note with interest, uh, and I will look in detail at what the, the Cabinet Secretary has brought forward, um, I would certainly be uh, interested in looking at the detailed impact and actually who will be uh, benefiting from the £150 council tax uh, reduction. And critically, I've got a key question uh, regarding whether or not disabled households uh, will benefit. Uh, and I, didn't, I may have missed the answer during my intervention, but I am... If, if this money is not coming through Barnet Consequentials, I would be interested to know where that money is coming from. Now, I did note in the, in the published spring uh, uh, budget revision that there was £284 uh, million in the reserve, and I'm just wondering whether that is where the funding is coming from, although I would note that does somewhat indicate that there was more money available as this budget process goes through. I'm happy to take that intervention. Uh, Cabinet Secretary. Just really briefly for clarity, I would say that um, spring budget revision is very much out of date. So, for example, the overall quantum has been revised down as well as it now being net of the 290. So there are two different changes that require a more substantial um, change, which I'll take through the Finance Committee. Daniel Johnson. Uh, can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that intervention? And, and clearly there's a lot more work to be done and we will examine the detail. I was also pleased to hear her uh, discuss the, the various allocations of the remaining 104 million. But again, I only uh, totaled three, £36 million pounds worth of additional uh, 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 sums within what she stated. I would be grateful if she could state when the, the extra £60 to £70 million will, will come. Uh, do I need to wind up, Deputy President? Officer? Uh, uh, maybe a, a minute or so would be. A minute or so. And ample sufficiency. Um, so, look, I, I, my final point I would like to make is I, I welcome the calls from the Cabinet Secretary and indeed from, from Mr Greer for a more constructive approach to the budget process. And indeed, I believe that's necessary. But can I suggest that we need three things? First of all, we need earlier a more open, ongoing dialogue. 
Simply meeting a day or two before the budget is published simply does not provide for that. Secondly, we need more transparency about the numbers. Calls not being made just by opposition parties, by Audit Scotland. We need to be able to track what, uh, where money goes from budget to announcement to outturn to consolidated accounts. The inability to actually see how money is being spent is impossible. And finally, there must be consistency. I know very different figures being used to discuss both £12 and £15 an hour in different places. Some consistency would be helpful. So we, there are some things that we can support in this budget. But quite simply, we cannot pass a budget on the back of poor, low pay for social care workers and cuts to frontline and foundational services delivered by councillors. And for those reasons, we will not be voting for the budget this evening. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. Thank you, Mr Johnson. And I now call on Birdo Fraser to wind up for the Scottish Conservatives. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. Can I start, as, as others have done, by congratulating the Finance Secretary on a happy news? Um, like Daniel Johnson, I can testify that uh, parenthood is a, a great joy. As, as the parent of two teenagers, you've no idea what a joy, a joy is. Uh, and just wait until your children get to the age where their friends control you on Instagram, and that will be something you can, you can look forward to. Um, but, standing officer, when we had the stage one debate on the budget three weeks ago, uh, I reminded the Chamber that what we were dealing with was the largest budget ever in the history of devolution. If we take out the extraordinary coronavirus funding in the course of last year, the Scottish Government have in the year to come more money to spend than ever before and I'm grateful to Daniel Johnson for confirming that in the course of this debate. And it's the task of the opposition parties to scrutinise the money that is spent and ask whether it has been properly uh, allocated, highlight areas of wastage where we feel that money could be put to better use, uh, as my uh, colleague Liz Smith did earlier. Ross Greer, in his contribution, raised an interesting point of process around the budget on whether or not opposition parties should present more detailed proposals. And this was an issue I remember being debated in the Finance Committee in the last session of Parliament at that point. And of course, one of the, the barriers that prevents that being taken forward is that it is only the government that is full sight of all the information. So we had this phenomenon that members of that vintage will recall in the last parliament where in exchanges both with the current finance secretary and her predecessor, many, many happy exchanges we had about the remarkable ability of the government to find money between the, the presentation of the draft budget and by the time the budget got to stages one and three, down at the back of the sofa, we used to call it. So by all means, the opposition could be brought in to present more information, as Mr Greer uh, asked for, but we would also have to have sight of that uh, ability to access the additional resource, which up till now the government has been reluctant to share with the opposition parties. Now, I mentioned uh, uh, in, the, in the stage one debate, and it was discussed earlier, the question of support for business. And this is an issue which is more important than ever. Over the last few weeks, I've spoken to a large number of hospitality businesses across Perthshire, and this has brought home to me the severe impact of the COVID restrictions which were introduced in December. Those in hospitality, having experienced two very difficult years, were looking forward to the Christmas and New Year period as an opportunity to make up for lost revenue. There were bookings for office lunches, for Christmas parties, family get-togethers. And when the advice came in early December from the Scottish Government that Christmas parties should not proceed, it was catastrophic for many businesses seeing virtually every single booking that they had be cancelled. This was at a time when many had already bought in supplies for Christmas. Food, alcohol, decorations, napkins, crackers, all that was required for the festive season, much of it unable to be reused. Now, in such circumstances, it is a reasonable ask for those businesses to say that they should be supported financially. And yet what has been offered by the Scottish Government falls short, far short, of compensating them for their losses. And as we speak, many businesses are still to receive a penny of support, now two months on from being told these restrictions were in place. And we called for the Scottish Government in this budget to provide 75% business rates relief for a full year for those in the retail, hospitality and leisure sector, a call widely supported by the business community. And the Scottish Government have instead only offered rates relief of 50% for the first three months and have capped this at £27,500. Um, uh, uh, yes, I will. Jim Fairley. Uh, thank you, the member, for taking an intervention. Would he also call on the UK government to halt the 20% uh, VAT that they're about to put on hospitality industries as well? Then, 
Martin Fraser. I've heard that call from many people in business, but they've also, of course, called on the Scottish Government to take action on business rates. Now, it's within the gift of this Scottish Government and within the context of this debate here in Parliament. Because the support that's been offered by the Scottish Government is less generous than the support being offered by the UK to businesses south of the border. Now, I raised earlier with the Cabinet Secretary this issue of uh, support for nightclubs, because it's a sector hard hit by the closures. N nightclubs have been squeezed. Mr. Mr. Fairley's been shouting at me from a sedentary position. He wants to give way again. Well, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, yes, I think a bit of calm uh, on the part of everybody would be helpful. Mr. Fraser, please continue. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, the particular problem with the operators of, of nightclubs. Nightclubs had, had a particularly difficult time over the past few years. They were looking forward to a busy Christmas uh, and New Year period uh, and, of course, faced closure. And the Scottish Government have provided a nightclub closure fund to help compensate them. Yes, look away. Daniel Johnson. Uh, I'm grateful to Murder for Years for giving me. Is he concerned, as I am, that there are nightclub owners who are still saying that they are yet to receive money? Indeed, some who are being claiming that they are being refused it because their music isn't loud enough. Is that one person that I said that 85 decibels was the threshold above which you had to play in your music to beat a nightclub? Murder Fraser. Well, that's a, that's a significant point from Mr. Mr. Johnson. I haven't heard that issue with the level of noise, but I have heard from other nightclub operators who have raised this issue about the fact that they are classed as hybrid premises because they have a bar alongside a nightclub. And because of that, they don't meet the criteria for support uh, from the Scottish Government. Now, earlier I urged the uh, Finance Secretary to address this. Uh, I know that the Nighttime Industries Association have, I believe, a meeting with the Scottish Government next week. And I hope the Scottish Government will listen to what they have to say, because it is a sector which has been hardest hit by the restrictions brought in and one that's being left high and dry without proper support. Now, the Scottish Government will say, and we've heard this from the Finance Secretary, there's more support for businesses in Scotland than applies south of the border. But we have to remember, businesses south of the border did not face the same level of restrictions that we have seen here in Scotland. And despite, of course, all the additional restrictions introduced in Scotland, there's no evidence whatsoever that we face a lesser impact of Omicron than was the case elsewhere in the United Kingdom. Now, presiding officer, we have had some discussion about the issue of local government. Despite the Finance Secretary finding an extra £120 million for Stage 1, we are still looking at real terms cuts for local government amounting to £250 million in their core grant. And despite what was announced... Uh, of course I will. Can I give Thank you, uh, the, the member for taking intervention. How can the Tories seriously talk about local government and no one, frankly, takes, does take them seriously on this issue when you're seeing 40% cuts in a manifesto promise south of the border on top of 37% real terms cuts? You know, your own record in government is so utterly woeful that to pose as a defender of local government is, frankly, embarrassing. Pick another topic next year. <laughs> you, you <laughs> You'd think, you'd think Mr Gibson would be embarrassed to raise a point that illustrates so perfectly the value of the fiscal transfer of £2,000 for every man, woman and child in Scotland from the rest of the United Kingdom, a fiscal transfer that he would throw away overnight because of his demand for Scottish separation. That's why we are seeing support for the Scottish public sector thanks to fiscal transfers from elsewhere in the UK. Now, despite the extra support, despite the extra... Oh, you're still shouting at me from a sedentary position. Do you want to give way again? Go on, you go. Kenneth Gibson. Seeing Mr. Uh, Mr Fraser is that the people of Scotland are less able to run their own country than their next-door neighbours are. Is that what you're actually saying? Where's the union dividend if what you say is true? Myrtle Fraser. Presiding officer, of course people in Scotland could choose to run their own country. Back in 2014, we asked that question. People chose to stay with the benefits of being in the United Kingdom, and they chose to be part of a union where the stronger economic part supports those with greater need, like in Scotland, which he would throw uh, away, presiding officer. Now, presiding officer, we've had some discussion about the issue of the cost of living crisis. crisis a really serious issue the cost of living crisis, a number of members referred to it. Uh, and of course, members on the SNP benches are very anxious to talk about what the Westminster government should be doing about the cost of living crisis. Let's look at what the Scottish government 
is doing about the cost of living crisis. We're seeing increases in council tax still for many households. We're seeing inflation busting increases in Scottish water charges, presiding officer. We're seeing the hated car park tax, meaning commuters will be paying up to £1,000 a year just to park their cars, presiding officer. We're seeing increases in rail tickets, presiding officer. We're even seeing the introduction, not just now, we're even seeing the introduction of compulsory smoke alarms costing hundreds of pounds that households will have to find at a time when budgets are being squeezed. <laughs> Presiding officer, each and every single one of those measures I have talked about is under the direct control of this government. And rather than talk about what Westminster should do, Presiding officer, they should be using the powers they have to try and address these measures. Mr Arnold wants to give way. Tom I'll Arthur. Come in. I'll, I'll give way. I'm very grateful. It's just a question in all sincerity. I wonder if he could explain what he thinks, if he does think, there is a relationship between the pandemic and all the disruption that has caused and the current cost of living crisis that we face. Murder Fraser. There, 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 are many, there are many different reasons behind the increase uh, in the cost of living. Uh, the pandemic has been a factor. The uh, rise in energy prices is a factor. The fact that uh, there is a shortage of supply of energy has been a factor. One wonders why the Scottish Government and their Green partners are talking about closing down oil production in the North Sea at the very point when fuel prices are going through the roof and hitting households right across Scotland, presiding officer. Now, we challenge once again in this debate to say where uh, money uh, would come from. John Mason made his usual contribution in this area. Presiding officer, let's just look again at the projections from the Fiscal Commission about the income tax coming into Scotland. Liz Smith referred to this earlier in the debate. If only we could grow the Scottish economy, not faster than the UK average, but even at the same rate as the UK average, the Finance Secretary wouldn't be looking at a big cut in the budget available to her because of the drop in income tax receipts. And if we want to find just a little bit of extra money, presiding officer, let's start with the £700,000 in civil servants' wages being spent preparing for another independence referendum that we know is not going to happen. <laughs> presiding officer, the Scottish Conservatives have been clear. This is, no, I, I'm just uh, uh, closing, presiding officer. The Scottish Conservatives have been clear this is not a budget we can support. With more money than ever before, it delivers cuts to local government and does not properly support businesses which have been struggling over the past two years. It is a budget which should be rejected by this chamber. Thank you, Mr Fraser. And I now call on Kate Forbes, Cabinet Secretary, to wind up for the Scottish Government. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And can I start by saying how grateful I am for the very kind words. I don't mean to coincide major life events with budgets. Um, it's just the way it's unfolded. And I can assure members that it wasn't designed to get out of next year's budget. Whether that's a pro or con, I will leave it to others to determine. But, Presiding Officer, I want to, to start today just with a reminder of the announcement that we have uh, made to help families. We're committing the full £290 million to support households, meaning 73% of all households in Scotland will receive £150 at a time when budgets are squeezed. And even more importantly, we will use the Council Tax Reduction Scheme to target support better, so that all households in receipt of Council Tax Reduction in any band it will receive that support, which is a reflection of need. And specifically, recognising the fuel impacts, the energy impacts, we will continue the Fuel Insecurity Fund to help households at the greatest risk of self-rationing their energy use. Presiding officer, though, it's important. I will. Pam Duncan Glancy. Thank you. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for taking the intervention. And also, I'd like to add my congratulations um, for your news this week. Um, the, the, this afternoon, I think while we've been in the chamber, there's been comments by leading poverty organisations saying that your, that your suggestions and your proposals on the cost of living are deeply disappointing and a missed opportunity to right a wrong from the Westminster Government. Can you, can you tell us what your response to that is, please? My Cabinet response Secretary. Is, is very similar to what I said in my opening remarks, where I was upfront and honest about two things. That one, this is an imperfect scheme, and we have intentionally chosen to distribute funding in a way that is simple and effective, knowing that some will receive it that don't need it, but others who do desperately need it will receive it. And that secondly, this has got to be seen in a much wider context. I read with interest some of the proposals that were sent from Age Scotland, 
and um, from uh, the, the, the analysis of the Joseph uh, Rowntree Foundation, um, if we had the full levers of a social security system or a tax system, I think we could do a far more targeted approach. But the uh, approach that we've taken ensures that families get help quicker rather than later. And obviously, deliverability is key, which is why COSLA are key delivery partners in all of this. And this has been developed um, in, in, in collaboration, as it were, with them. Yep. Pam Duncan Glancy. Um, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for being generous with her interventions. Um, the, the point about targeting um, is actually is, is important, of course, but there are levers and powers available to the Scottish Government to have targeted the support to low-income families better, including to target it to those on the Carers Alliance supplement and to target it to people on pension credit, um, and also to target it to, to families with, um, who access child winter heating payments. Would the Cabinet Secretary agree with, with, with us that that would be an appropriate way to target it to low-income households? I, I certainly think that needs to be part of the package. And obviously I announced in my um, opening comments that it needs to be seen in that context. The, the fact that there has been additional carers allowance is one example in uh, the supplement in 2020 and again in 2021. Um, the winter support fund over this winter, £41 million, the low income pandemic payments uh, last year to everyone in receipt of council tax reduction. These are examples of where we have sought to, to target our funding. Um, in terms of the deliverability point, we have looked at a lot of, of options and ultimately the way to get funding out as quickly as possible in April rather than waiting months is to do it in the way that we've outlined. But I am in no way shying away from the fact that this is imperfect and thankfully we do have a council tax reduction scheme in place that allows us to identify those households that are in greater need to provide uh, support to them. And again, I reiterate, I think we have time, so sure. Paul Sweeney. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for giving away that point. Just at the first stage of the budget, the Cabinet Secretary announced that she was giving councils the option to raise council tax as an option to offset budget cuts, given that her announcement of additional funding um, was only account for a third of the proposed cuts. Surely that means that if any councils do choose to increase the council tax, it will wipe out at a stroke any additional support coming down from this measure. Uh, can, can I, I dispute secretary? the premise of that point? Uh, we did not give councils, ta councils the, the discretion over council tax for any reason beyond the fact that they have been asking for that discretion for years. I don't think there has been a single budget call with COSLA that I have been in where they have not raised specifically the request to uh, get discretion. And in terms of the position for our local authorities, I was going to come on to that because it is a point that has been raised a number of times in this uh, debate already in terms of the final position for council. So I will come on to that. Um, Presiding officer, this budget, which all parties will have the opportunity to vote on at 5pm today, is a budget that is about tackling inequalities. There is £3.9 billion for benefits next year to provide support to over a million people. There is uh, £197 million to deliver the Scottish Child Payment, doubling it to £20 a week. This budget will continue to tackle homelessness with £831.5 million towards the delivery of more affordable housing. And it's got £200 million for the Scottish Attainment Challenge as part of a commitment to provide a billion pounds over the Parliament to tackle the poverty-related attainment gap. We all know what the major challenges are. And I would um, uh, thank um, uh, Paul Sweeney for raising the point that the Joseph Rowntree uh, Foundation has made clear that the impact of the current cost of living will disproportionately uh, impact um, some families, uh, lower-income families. And that is why this holistic approach to providing more targeted uh, help is so critically important. Presenting officer, can I pick up on some other points uh, that were raised by colleagues? Because all members, I think, uh, talked, or, or all parties at least, talked about local government. And I think Miles Briggs did illustrate, uh, in my mind, a central point that it's the heart uh, of the debate on, on, on local government, that social care is a key part of, of local government's responsibilities. And the funding for it, therefore, is a key part of the overall settlement. But a lot of parties exclude that when talking about the settlement, because for local government, this budget will deliver a real terms growth to the settlement. It will protect the core budget, which increases by £120 million in cash terms. But over and above that, we will see £354 million 
for health and social care integration, £200 million to support investment in health and social care, £145 million for additional teachers and support staff, as well as significant funding for the child bridging payments, as well as rolling out um, free school meals. Yes, I will. Graeme Simpson. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for taking the intervention? If the budget is so good for local government, uh, can she name any councils that are not having to put up council tax? Cabinet Secretary. We have provided additional £120 million so that no council has to deliver inflationary busting uh, council tax increases. But the point I'm making here is that when members debate the local government settlement, they are excluding the very point that Miles Briggs was putting to me quite legitimately about the fact that social care is under pressure. We have increased funding for social care as part of our renewed commitment to pass on health consequentials, not just to the health service, but to social care as well. And that is excluded in much of the debate and discussion. Presiding officer, uh, Labour have uh, rightly, I think, over, over the last uh, few years, and, and again this year, highlighted the need for us to support carers. The budget that Labour will vote against tonight increases carers' pay by 10.5 per cent over the last year. That is a 10.5 per cent increase in carers' pay, precisely for the reasons that I think Daniel Johnson quite rightly outlined that to build resilience into the, the social care system, we need to make sure that carers are rewarded and remunerated um, rightly. And there's obviously a clear commitment too, as part of the National Care Service to uh, build in collective uh, bargaining. Presiding officer, all parties have indicated uh, and identified the need to invest in economic recovery, and that's why we are doing precisely that. Murder Fraser talked about business support, as others did. He also talked about the Omicron impact on hospitality businesses. Hospitality businesses in Scotland that weren't paying a penny of rates under the SNP, hospitality businesses in England under the Conservatives were paying rates. So it's all right to talk about the need to extend uh, non-domestic rates relief. But when businesses needed it, the SNP government ensured they had support. And the same cannot be said for the UK yeah. government. Presiding officer, ultimately, when it comes to, to supporting the economy, there has been much debate about the need for some game-changing policies that accelerate growth. And my plea would be to actually deliver on that rhetoric in terms of ideas, concrete ideas, tangible ideas, because there is much in the way of uh, denigrating and criticising, very little in the way of tangible policies that the other parties have put forward which will accelerate the growth that they call for. Presiding officer, I was going to go through the contributions that were made uh, by other parties, but I won't suffice, uh, apart from making two quick comments. One, uh, Michelle Thompson talked, um, I think, uh, very uh, helpfully um, about um, the challenges that we face, but also some of the hypocrisy. She talked, for example, about waste, and all of us have seen the reports of the £4.9 billion of fraudulent business loans under the UK government and the £8.7 billion of PPE written off. So in terms of waste, perhaps the Conservatives would start with their own colleagues. And Jamie Halker Johnson made... Jamie Halker Johnson made a, a point about Highlands and Islands Enterprise that I want to um, ensure um, the, the answer is on the record. The enterprise agencies have all have seen a um, record level of funding, the highest level of funding since 2010-2011 because of the critical role that they play in economic recovery. And HIE plays an absolutely essential role in the Highlands and Islands economic recovery. That is why we've maintained their spending power. And what Jamie Halper Johnson referred to as a reduction is a non-cash reduction. That is about accounting charges like depreciation. And I want to make sure it's clear that this is about protecting our enterprise agencies. <laughs> Lastly, and perhaps uh, not least, Paul McLennan talked about uh, the wider economic impacts that we are all contending with. And he did talk about the impact of Brexit, the impact of uh, the cumulative costs on businesses, and it reminds me of the labour shortages debate we had a few weeks ago, when on one hand Conservatives were at pains to say Brexit's not the problem, labour shortages are there in France as well, 
but in the same breath blame all their economic woes on the SNP. You cannot have it both ways. And speaking directly to businesses, it's quite clear where much of this, uh, cha the, these challenges are coming from. And so, presiding officer, having uh, endeavoured to take us right up to five o'clock um, at, I think, the request of uh, filling time, um, I am delighted to commend uh, the budget to the Chamber this afternoon. It is a budget that is ambitious. It's in a budget that's bold. It's um, an, um, uh, an ambitious budget that delivers for the people of Scotland, highlighting their priorities and ensuring that, as a government, we are quick to respond to the needs that have emerged since the 9th of December. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. That concludes the debate on Budget Scotland Bill. It is now time to move on to the next item of business, which is consideration of a legislative consent motion. And I ask Hamza Youssef to speak to and move motion number 3054 on Health and Care Bill UK legislation. Uh, pleased to move this bill, uh, move this motion in my name. Thank you very much. The question on this motion will be put at decision time. There are three questions as a result of today's business. The first is that motion 3124 in the name of Ivan McKee on professional qualifications bill UK legislation be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament is not agreed, therefore we will move to a vote and there will be a short pause to allow members to access the digital voting system.